American game becomes, in fact, a truly national sport. This is a brief documentary of the birth of Major League Baseball in the Pacific Northwest, from conception by the voters of King County on February 13, 1968, to delivery in six stadium on that memorable April 11th in the year of 1969. population capital of the Pacific Northwest had long yearned for major league athletic status. It enviously eyed the ascension of San Francisco and Los Angeles into baseball's big leagues. Unable to convince themselves that Seattle was indeed a major league community, the city remained cloaked in an atmosphere of anonymity and indifference until the World's Fair of 1962 proved that Seattle could do what no other major city could accomplish stage and international exposition that proved to be an artistic and economic success. Like a sleeping giant, the region awoke to the realization that it was ready to take its place among the nation's centers of cultural achievement. Major League Baseball was part of the program. Since securing a big league franchise requires the blending of many factors, a group spearheaded by Dewey and Max Soriano of Seattle joined forces with Cleveland industrialist William R. Daly and the pilots became an embryo soon to blossom under the corporate name of Pacific Northwest Sports Incorporated. A Major League Baseball team must have a place to play and a contingency of the award of an American League franchise was the guarantee of a stadium that would accommodate crowds which might someday see Seattle hosting the All-Star Game and eventually the World Series. Because of Seattle's unpredictable spring weather and because the community badly needed a multi-purpose facility to accommodate conventions and other events, the voters of the region were asked to assist in financing an indoor, all-weather building similar to the Houston Astrodome. Star New York Yankee slugger Mickey Mantle and former Boston and California outfielder Jimmy Pearsall went to bat for Seattle and with help from Boston's Carl Yastrzemski, the group stumped throughout the region, urging support for the stadium bonds and telling the story of Major League Baseball and the many rewards it brings to community life. Get that dome up here because it's, uh, it's really uh, a good thing to have. I live in Texas, and whenever you tell someone you're from Texas, the first thing they ask you is, isn't that where the Astrodome is? And it's really good. Uh, I think uh, it pays for itself. I think the American League has, uh, uh, come, has come up with a fine plan. Uh, there are 30 American League players. President Joe Cronin was a Seattle visitor, and, uh, lending credence to the assurance that a stadium yes vote would bring a franchise to the area. The day of reckoning finally arrived, and a heavy turnout of voters flocked to the polls in King County to decide whether the region would return to the provincial pre-World's Fair atmosphere or plunge forward into a brave new world. hours of Wednesday, February 14, 1968, Dewey Soriano picked up his telephone and reported to an anxious Joe Cronin that the voters had passed the stadium bonds by a majority of 62 percent. Seattle was in the big leagues. Now the work began in earnest. The team was given a nickname, the Pilots. The city of Seattle agreed to remodel Six Stadium as an interim plant. Portable offices were positioned adjacent to the former minor league park that for years housed Seattle's Pacific Coast League teams. Top men in the world of baseball were selected to help guide the pilot's ship. Marvin Milks, on the right, was the moving force behind the development of another expansion team, the California Angels. He would be the general manager. One of his first appointments was the naming of young Carl Keel as West Coast scouting supervisor. Keel would later work closely with Milk's special assistant, Bobby Mattick. The pilots selected a local favorite and former Major League star from Snohomish to manage in the Seattle farm system. The hiring of Earl Torgerson was just one of many similar appointments that were being made on a day-to-day -day basis as the crew of the pilot's ship began to take shape. But every ship has to have a skipper, and while the newspapers and radio stations speculated wildly as to who would manage the pilots on the field, General Manager Milks was eyeing a somewhat unknown personality, who at that time was helping lead the St. Louis Cardinals to two straight National League flags 
and a World Series confrontation with the Detroit Tigers. His name, Joe Schultz, third base coach of the St. Louis Cardinals. Schultz was announced as the pilot skipper on the final day of the 68 World Series as the Cards lost to the Tigers, and then it was off to Seattle to meet the press and the public. The pilots had a field boss, but only a few players, some of whom were purchased during the months leading up to the big day when Seattle's large staff of scouts, managers, and coaches would invade Boston for the expansion draft meetings and the selection of players from the rosters of existing American League clubs. While most of the evaluating of American League rosters had been done in the months leading up to the draft selections, trial runs on the selections themselves kept the pilots burning the midnight oil right up to the big moment on the evening of October 14, 1968, when Seattle President Dewey Soriano and Kansas City Royals owner Ewing Kaufman watched Joe Cronin flip a coin to determine which club would make the first choice. On the next day, October 15, 1968, the pilots spent $5,250,000 on 30 players who would provide the nucleus of Seattle's entry into the American League. Who were they? Well, there was Rich Rollins, the hard-hitting third baseman from the Minnesota Twins. Don Mincher, an all-star first baseman with the Minnesota Twins and the California Angels. Fleet-footed Tommy Harper, never given a chance to run with the previous team, became the most exciting ball player in contemporary Seattle history. Jerry McNurtney, an experienced, intelligent catcher from the Chicago White Sox. Wayne Comer, the hard-nosed outfielder from the Detroit Tigers. Ray Euler, who came to Seattle from the Tigers and must be the only player to ever have a fan club before he wore the home team's uniform. And Marty Patton, the promising young pitcher from the Angels, one of many young prospects who must provide the future for the pilot. These and some 40-odd others reported to Joe Schultz in late February at the pilot's spring training camp in Tempe, Arizona, a lavish installation carved out of the southwestern desert. The stadium and its practice field were termed best in the west. This, then, was to be the spring home of the pilots, and with the start of drills, the Pacific Northwest's first Major League Baseball team was off and running. Friday, March 7, 1969, the Seattle Pilots played their first exhibition game, and their opponents were the Cleveland Indians. Early in the going, and with two out, Wayne Comer single. Then Ray Euler, who hit only 135 with the Detroit Tigers in 1968, laced a long fly ball to left that cleared the 350 mark on the fence. Seattle was on its way to a lopsided 19-3 victory. With almost two months of intensive training behind them, the pilots headed home. They had opened their inaugural American League season on the road against the California Angels in Anaheim and won their first game, lost the second. They were to come home to a gala welcome. At the airport, press, radio, and television swarmed about the pilots as though they were home from their first World Series victory. General Manager Marvin Milks and television star Bridget Hanley led the procession of celebrities as the caravan of cars began assembling to transport Seattle's new heroes to a big downtown reception. 